The Library of Congress Packard Campus for Audiovisual Conservation in Culpeper, Virginia, preserves and provides access to the library's vast collection of films, television programs, radio broadcasts, and sound recordings. American History TV visited the facility to learn about the paper print collection, films from the earliest era of motion pictures produced between 1894 and 1912. Over 3,000 paper prints were created for copyright purposes but cannot be projected. They must be scanned one frame at a time in order to be copied. My name is Mike Michon. I'm head of the Moving Image section here at the Library of Congress, the home of the largest collection of film and video in the world. Within this building we have not only the film, video, and sound recording collections of the library, but we also have preservation laboratories that are dedicated to making sure that all of this material is available for future generations. The story of the Packard campus actually begins in the late 1990s. Our benefactor, David Packard, was interested in creating a facility for the library that would house both the collections and the, the preservation laboratories. There was a facility here in Culpeper that had gone up for sale. It used to belong to the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Virginia. And at its height, from the late 1960s until it closed in 1993, it stored $3 billion in coin and currency that was going to be used to pump up the U.S. economy east of the Mississippi in the event of a nuclear catastrophe. The building was for sale. The Packard Humanities Institute purchased it in 1997 and controlled the construction for over the next several years, next 10 years. And over time, we worked with the people from the Packard Humanities Institute into what the facility is today. The vision expanded over time. We now have a facility that's almost half a million square feet, not only has the collections and the preservation laboratories, but it also uh, houses our, uh, di our data infrastructure, all of our cataloging teams are here. Everything that we need to describe, uh, preserve, and make available to the American public are audiovisual collections. Our collections previously had been uh, held in four states plus the District of Columbia. Our nitrate film, for example, was stored at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. That's where our film preservation laboratory was. The video and audio preservation laboratories were in the Madison Building uh, up on uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, we had storage in Pennsylvania, storage in Maryland, Virginia, District of Columbia. It was nice to have it all in one place. Our collection begins with the beginning of cinema. The earliest film that we have in our collection comes from 1891. Uh, this is a camera test uh, that was um, uh, produced by the Thomas Edison Company. The film was called Newark Athlete. It just shows a young man swinging some Indian clubs. It's only a few frames long. It was part of a series of experiments that Edison and his engineers uh, engaged in in the early 1890s. Where our collection really begins, though, is in 1893 with first films that were registered for copyright. It was in the fall of 1893 that Thomas Edison started registering films for copyright, but the earliest surviving registered film that we have came to the library in January of 1894. It was called an Edison Kinetoscopic Record of a Sneeze. And colloquially, it's known as Fred Ott's Sneeze. Very sh again, very short film, only a few frames long. It shows one of the Edison engineers, Fred Ott, who is known for his comical sneezes. So you see Fred put a little bit of snuff in his nose, and then he has a very violent sneeze. Now, this did not come to the library on film. There was no provision in the copyright law in 1894 to allow for celluloid film to be registered for copyright because really celluloid roll film just being in the process of being invented. So what Edison did is he exposed the negative for kinetoscopic record of a sneeze on strips of photographic contact paper, affixed them to a cardboard backing and sent it into the library to be registered as a photograph. Now, you have to think about this for a moment, because we do all the time. 
the paper print collection as it came to be known in that sense really was an historical accident. The name has been lost to the midst of time, but we're very grateful for whatever library bureaucrat decided that it would be okay to register this as a photograph. It's not one photograph, it's a series of photographs, but yet they allowed it to be registered. So once that happened, then the floodgates kind of opened. So Edison started registering more films on paper with the library starting in 1894. And Edison was a very prolific film producer up until 1900, you know, he produced nearly 800 films. So there, there started to be more and more films come in for copyright on paper. And then other producers started following along behind Edison, people like Sigmund Lubin in Philadelphia, the Biograph Company, which was actually started by Edison's former uh, uh, engineer W.K.L. Dixon, uh, and then many, many others through the, you know, the first decade of the 20th century. And they, all of these people were registering their films with us as paper prints. And that continued up until 1912 when the copyright law was changed to allow for the submission of motion picture film. So now people were, tr were registering celluloid film, the type of film that we know today. But the library didn't have any storage, really, for the celluloid film. It was printed on nitrocellulose film stock, was, which was highly flammable. And so the library didn't keep any of the film that came registered as film. We didn't do that until the late 1940s when we acquired some storage that allowed us to keep nitrate film. But up until 1912, we have this glorious collection of uh, films on paper print, uh, roughly 3,300 titles, all of which are available to view. This, the paper prints are the crown jewel of our collection. They form the basis of everything that we have collected since then. And we have put more effort into the paper prints than any other single collection. We continue to work on them today. At the very beginning of cinema, the vast majority of films that were produced were not what we would think of as fictional films. They were, were called actualities, or little documentaries, showing everyday life, people at work, people at leisure, uh, current events. Uh, so there was a tremendous amount of that. And one of the examples that, that I have here actually comes from 1904. Uh, this is a series of films that was shot by the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company. It's part of a series called the Westinghouse Works. As this was shot for the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, there were roughly 29 films that were uh, produced for this series, of which 21 survive in the paper print collection. So this chronicles several factories that were owned by Westinghouse. This one is called the Panorama, the Machine Company Isle. Beautiful, beautiful film. It was taken essentially from an, an overhead crane uh, that was uh, moving along a, a, a track there in the factory and showing people below on the factory floor doing their work. It's a wonderful, just a, a amazing record of what American industry looked like at this particular time. Um, and so uh, these films were, were uh, incredibly popular when they were shown in 1904 in St. Louis. They had special screenings for the Westinghouse employees in uh, uh, Pitt Pittsburgh. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, these, you will see these films used a lot uh, in documentaries. These films were commissioned by Westinghouse, so they were paid for, and uh, American Mutoscope and Biograph actually shot them. The cameraman for these films is a man named Billy Bitzer, who becomes much more well-known in film history because he was the chief cameraman for D.W. Griffith later on. So, but these are, are very important and beautiful films that, that uh, Mr. Bitzer shot for Westinghouse. The intent of these films was to show the work as it was progressing, not to have anything set up 
uh, not being staged. Uh, certainly, there, when you look at the film, there, there, you're going to see people who are looking up at the camera. I mean, this is something that you're not going to see every day. But by and large, there's far too much activity going on to, on the floor for it to be staged. So it's just, a, a, you know, just, it, it's fascinating to watch as a, as a document of American industry at the time. In 1904, a film like this, an actuality like this, would not really have been novel at all because there had been a lot of films that were made like that. But the way in which these were shot, uh, the, the sort of chronicling of a lot of activity of, in a particular aspect of American industry, that was very unique. And certainly a shot like this one, the panorama of the machine company aisle, is very unique just because of the camera angle that Bitzer was able to get. And the vast expanse of this factory floor is, it's, to this day, it remains an astonishing film to watch. Some of the actuality films that we have in the collection are particularly fascinating and we see researchers coming back to them again and again. There are some that, that, that I think of. Uh, uh, one uh, is uh, New York City Ghetto Fish Market. There are a whole series of films that are shot in New York because that's where my center of film production, a lot of it was in New York at the time. This is an Edison film, which you, again, you're sort of seeing a camera placed above a street scene and, uh, and, uh, and seeing uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the vendors below uh, and it, just to see the, the costumes and the faces of people looking up at the camera. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating film that a lot of people have gone back to again and again. Uh, there were several films that were taken of immigrants arriving at Ellis Island. And it's just shots of people getting off the boat uh, at Ellis Island, uh, which is a, uh, it's a wonderful film. We have a, a whole series of films that were shot both before and after the San Francisco earthquake. So we've got some uh, that were made uh, literally in the weeks before uh, the, uh, the San Francisco earthquake. Uh, one of them uh, is particularly popular called A Trip Down Market Street, in which a camera was just mounted on the front of a streetcar and, and, and it follows the streetcar path all the way down Market Street in San Francisco. That was taken a few weeks uh, before the San Francisco earthquake in April 1906. And then, of course, cameramen uh, rushed out to chronicle a lot of the fire and the destruction that happened in San Francisco uh, in the wake of the earthquake. Uh, we have other little interesting oddities in the collection, like for example, we have advertisements. The very earliest ad that we have in our collection uh, comes uh, is in 1898. It's an ad called Admiral Cigarettes. Another that's interesting too, this is from 1903. This is for gold dust scouring powder. Okay, now you'll notice the uh, sort of unique format of this. This is from a Biograph camera in 1903. The, the paper is wider, it's got this unique center perforation, that was the way that their camera was manufactured. Uh, and this is an ad for gold dust scouring powder featuring the gold dust twins who were, were on the packaging uh, for gold dust powder. Uh, so it's, uh, there's so much information that you can learn about uh, American culture. The paper prints just serve as an endless resource for the study of manufacturing and popular culture and lived experience at the beginning of the 20th century. There's just, there's really nothing else like it. So actuality of these documentary films were 
very important, very popular in cinema up until the turn of the century. But in 1902, things start to change. And we know this because of the paper prints. We start to see more fiction film, more films with actors that are acting out a scene. This is not real life. This is a constructed reality. And Edison hired a director in, uh, in 1902, a man named Edwin S. Porter, who becomes very important for the history of film. He made a few early films for Edison, narrative films, in which he's kind of playing around with some of the editing uh, techniques. Uh, and it sort of culminates in 1903 with a film called The Great Train Robbery. Now, this is a very important film in film history as well. We think of this as the first feature-length narrative film. So it tells a story of a train robbery. The action is intercut where you see the, uh, the mail train being, being robbed. Uh, you see the outlaws. You see action taking place in, in, in different locations. And it's cut together in such a way that you can easily understand the story. But it was radical editing at the time. This is our original paper print deposit of the Great Train Robbery, including the very